we're going to cover off five really quick topics tonight. We're going to talk about basic sleep physiology. We'll talk about screening for sleep in our practices. And for some of us, that might be the end point. You might decide that you want to know a little bit about sleep. You're going to screen, but you're not going to treat it. And if you're not going to treat it, you'll refer those patients out to somebody else that will. Perfectly fine. Hope you're near me. And then we'll talk about testing and the, the protocols, the treatment regimens, uh, the technology about testing, and then different pathways for the patient to take, depending on what state you're in. Most of the states have a pretty uh, liberal way that that can be done. And then we'll talk a little bit about billing, documentation, software marketing, that kind of thing. Um, so we're going we're gonna to say about dental sleep medicine, it's a little bit different than dentistry. And I'm not trying to discount what we've all done as dentists, but when we think about dental sleep medicine, it is really hugely about changing lives. Um, there's a picture on the left-hand side. It's not the actual picture that the patient sent me, but one of my patients early on when I was treating sleep, I texted her the next morning to ask her how she slept last night, the first night with her device. And she sent me a picture of her dog, a dog that looked very much like this dog, and said, this is the first night that Sully, that was her dog's name, Sully, stayed in bed with me because I snore. She's divorced and, and her dog is her best friend right now. And uh, Sully doesn't stay in bed with her. Sully goes to bed with her and then leaves when uh, Rhea starts snoring. So I think it was kind of important to note that bed partners aren't always spouses or men or women, partners that we have. Sometimes it's even just the companionship of an animal that is, that is impacted by, by the snoring. And I'm not suggesting that snoring is anywhere in the category of obstructive sleep apnea. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but it's critical. Uh, in the middle is an interesting little uh, text that I got just, uh, can you see the, oh, it doesn't say the date. It says today at 8 a.m. So this was uh, Tuesday morning. I delivered advice on Monday and I texted uh, my patient. I said, Marie, good morning. How'd you sleep last night? She said, good morning. Slept great. Ted, that's her husband, said no snoring that he would call. So didn't want to get up this morning because it felt so good to really sleep. And then she was working that morning on getting her bite back because we always know that when we pull our mandibles down and forward with a, an oral appliance, sleep apnea that uh, the challenge the next morning is getting a bite back. And, and we can do that very predictably. I haven't had anybody lose a bite. The right-hand side is a reminder of uh, a young patient I had, 35 years old, my daughter's age, came in and he found us on the internet because he believed he might have um, obstructive sleep apnea. And I said, why do you think that? He didn't look like it at all. He said, well, because I have high blood pressure, so does my dad. And we're all being treated by this physician and we take these medications. And he described in his own words that he had drug-resistant hypertension. And we know today that drug-resistant hypertension is primarily caused by obstructive sleep apnea and it interferes with the mechanisms that allows the medications to work effectively. So we put him on uh, an oral appliance. He still had trouble sleeping because he had triplets during the therapy, but his blood pressure immediately became manageable by every medication that he took. He was able to decrease his dosage. His physician was amazed. Now, it wasn't so much that I did anything magical for or with his physician. This patient researched on the internet and found this solution and found me and found a way to reduce his um, uh, uh, responsiveness and, and relationship with his hypertensive medications. And we've got literally dozens and dozens of, uh, of video and online postings and chats and things like that of patients that have been impacted by the kind of things that we do. Spouses that get back to them in the bedroom and patients that can finally begin to lose weight and, and change their medications and live life more to the fullest. So I wouldn't want to discount the kinds of things we do from a dental perspective with traditional clinical dentistry, but I'm going to tell you, this stuff is pretty cool. This stuff is really cool. So let's talk about basic sleep physiology. So most of you should already know this, so I'll go fast through some of these slides. That's why there'll be good reference material for you. But but what happens is um, we're unique as mammals. No other mammal has this huge gap between the uvula hanging down in the back of the throat and the epiglottis. When we uh, began to walk upright, extended our necks and our larynx dropped down and we began to speak, a lot of our anatomy changed. When it did, it left this very susceptible area to the tongue to fall back between the uvula and the epiglottis. This exposed area was very easily closed off by the tongue. Now, as you might think about it too, evolutionarily, as we've begun to have smaller and smaller lower faces, but still a fairly large sized tongue, which is required for speech and eating. But because we don't use our teeth the way we used to for eating, the bony box that holds the tongue has gotten smaller and the tongue has remained pretty large. So even in the absence of obesity or other factors, we've got a size nine tongue in a size seven or eight bony box. And it's much more likely for that tongue to fall back and close off the airway. When it closes off the airway, you might get some snoring. Snoring is no big deal. It's an annoyance. It's noisy. 
but it does not mean you have sleep apnea. There are people who snore who don't have sleep apnea. There are also people who don't snore and have sleep apnea. And sometimes when we treat sleep apnea, the snoring goes away most of the time, thank goodness. Sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes the snoring goes away and the apnea doesn't improve. And so it's, uh, they're often linked together, but they're a little bit independent, independent enough that we can't put them together. There's also central sleep apnea. So sometimes people's disturbances with their sleep are not caused by an obstruction sleep apnea or an obstruction in the breathing tube, but rather from the central nervous system's inability to produce a desire to breathe. Of course, you still wake up and breathe. So it still has the disruptive sleep and all of the symptomology of that, and also some comorbidity development. But um, unlike an obstructive sleep apnea, pulling the mandible forward in a central patient will not help at all. That patient must be on a CPAP or have some sort of a pharmacological intervention. So we also know that sleep is um, normal. We go through three stages of sleep, um, stage one, stage two, and then what we call stage three or deep sleep. We're supposed to spend about 25% of our time in deep sleep. And then beyond deep sleep, we go into REM, rapid eye movement, dream sleep. We should spend about another 20 to 25% of our time in that. High five, that's great. But all of us, everybody, will sometimes have their tongue fall back and close off their airway. Everybody has that happen, especially during REM sleep. Why during REM sleep? Because we're more paralyzed. So the second half of the night, when we see most of our REM sleep, we're a little bit more paralyzed. We're more likely to have a three or 4% drop in our oxygenation. And that's an event if there's also a reduction in flow of 30% that lasts at least 10 seconds. So if you breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, stop. Now hold it right there. Now you can breathe again. That was a 10 second reduction of 100% in airflow. That's called an apnea. If there's a 30% reduction and a three or 4% drop in oxygenation of your blood, that's a hypopnea. In all of us, in normal people who don't have sleep apnea, that is supposed to happen between zero and five times per hour. So if it happens more than that, we say you have obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is mild if it's between 5 and 15. It's moderate if it's between 15 and 30. And it's severe if it's greater than 30. Yep, we see 60, 90. There are patients over 100. I've never actually treated a patient that was over 100, but there are patients that are over 100. So it's a devastating thing in terms of the um, comorbidities that it supports and helps cause. So we know that sleep is going to give us all kinds of refreshing, uh, rejuvenation, both from a physiologic and a mental standpoint, no question about that. We know that we're supposed to spend certain amounts of time in different deep sleep. So if something jacks with your sleep, obstructive sleep apnea, staying up too long, alcohol, any number of things, there will be repercussions to pay. Now, the repercussions that most people think about and talk about are the kind that create the economic cost and the economic toil of obstructive sleep apnea. I'm far more concerned in the hypertension, the diabetes, the uh, congestive heart failure, um, arrhythmia, stroke, and cardiovascular disease that seem to be exacerbated by the presence of obstructive sleep apnea. A patient in COVID, for example, is 3.5 times more likely to die if they have COVID than if they don't. They're much more susceptible to COVID as well because they already have a respiratory compromise or complication. If, if you can't understand or think about how prevalent this disease is, it's 20 to 25% of the general popular, the general adult population. We also see it in kids. Tonight, we're going to talk mostly about adults. I'll have one or two slides on kids, and we'll talk about their role. But this is a huge problem. If you don't believe what a huge problem it is, take out your phone. Take out your phone right now while you're sitting there watching a webinar. Nobody ever says it. Everybody says, take out your phone and turn it off. And I'm going to say, take out your phone and open it up and open up a browser, open up Chrome or Safari, whatever you use as a browser, and just type in two words. Don't type anything other than this. Type in the word Y as a search, space AM, W-H-Y space AM, and what comes up. Isn't that amazing? The first two or three of the first four are why am I tired? Why am I so tired? Why am I always tired? This is a huge problem in our society today. If you open the television, a newspaper, watch any of the media, you can't watch for 15 minutes without seeing two or three pillow ads, mattress ads, something about sleep, inspire, any number of medications that help you with sleep. It's crazy 
We are a sleep deprived society. I wouldn't say the problem, but one of the issues is the media worries mostly about the Hoboken train disaster, Reggie White dying in his sleep of a heart attack. Um, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia dying of a heart attack with his CPAP on the bed next to him. I'm not saying these aren't unimportant things, of course they are, but our tiredness during the day, our motor vehicle accident propensity, um, workplace accidents, decreased productivity, those are all huge components of what obstructive sleep apnea causes and the media focuses on that. But tonight I wanna to focus much more so on the systemic, the sympathetic nervous systems on and off triggered mechanism and how that impacts so many different aspects of our physiology. It is freaking scary. It is so scary that in fact, we see a significant reduction in the life expectancy of people that have obstructive sleep apnea. You can't go to any sleep class without seeing a slide. It's called the Wisconsin cohort study and they took uh, thousands of people and studied them over a period of time, 20 years. And the green line you see on the top is the healthy population that does not have sleep apnea, the survival rates of that population over 20 years. Then you see mild, moderate, and severe. And you can see that there was a approximately a 57% or 57% survival rate or 43% loss mortality in the population of patients with severe sleep apnea, severe obstructive sleep apnea. That's pretty serious. So if that doesn't scare you enough, then I would remind you that the person with obstructive sleep apnea that you might see or screen in your practice is 23 times, not seven, not eight, not 11 times, like all of these other contributing factors that we worry about and the media talks about, but the OSA patient is 23 times more likely to die of a heart attack in their sleep. How in the world do we have a cardiovascular event? And especially in our sleep, when we're supposed to be laying down and resting, that doesn't make any sense. You're supposed to have a heart attack when you're in Michigan pushing a car out of a snowbank. And instead, if this patient is sleeping and resting, how do they have a heart attack? Well, they have a heart attack because when they're deprived of oxygen, what happens? Blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, their body thinks they're pushing a car out of a snowbank, comma, pause, wait for it, but they're ill-prepared to manage with it because they're asleep. And the stress and strain that that puts on the cardiovascular system is untoward and it can't be responded to in large part because these people are often mouth breathers, at least at night, and often are deprived of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is only made through good nasal breathing. And if we're a little short of nitric oxide and we're short of a very important chemical, that is a very important vasodilator. It's the active ingredient in the little blue pill for men or women, I guess, but mostly men. But nitro, nitro, nitric oxide is also the active ingredient in nitroglycerin that we would give to somebody under their tongue if they were having a little angina pain and we wanted to dilate the cardiovascular uh, mechanisms. And so they're deprived of that. When we look across all of the more common uh, diseases like diabetes, arrhythmias, um, heart attack, stroke, hypertension, depression, congestive heart failure. You look at the inside of the graph in the gray sections, that's the ambient population. The bottom of the graph is young, the top of the graph is older, and you can see how it increases in the population as you get older, those diseases do, no surprise there. But then you look at the dotted lines on the outside, red women, blue men, that's the increase in propensity for that disease state in an OSA population. So it is so much that, although we do think that uh, medicine does think that obstructive sleep apnea is the primary cause and the single most prevalent cause for arrhythmias, obstructive sleep apnea is never a cause of death. They have a heart attack or they have a stroke or they have kidney or they have all of these things which have been exacerbated by the fact that they have obstructive sleep apnea. Well, how do we get into this state where obstructive sleep apnea is so prevalent. Well, we talked a little bit about it in terms of jaw size and jaw development and growth. And our current diet has impacted dramatically how large our jaws are. If we look back just four, five, 600 years, we see mandibles with lower anterior teeth canted forward. We see maxillas and mandibles with appropriate room for their wisdom teeth, their third molars. Um, we see larger chewing mechanisms, larger musculature, we see better vertical components. We see less probably propensity for temporal mandibular dysfunction because the type of diet they have require them to use that system a lot more. And when you use that system, it grows bigger, stronger, and more robust. And, and cooking food and using a knife and fork allowed us to eat mushier food and softer food 
don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want to go back to the paleo times and uh, paleo diet maybe for a while to lose some weight, but I don't want to go back to the paleo times and look like a caveman. But those kinds of diets were absolutely fantastic for the growth and development and maturity of our lower third of our face. Breastfeeding was another um, aspect. When you look at some of these Aboriginal populations around the world where they swaddle and feed vertically the child on the mother's uh, chest and just goes from breast to breast to, to breastfeed, those children do very well. And there is essentially no obstructive sleep apnea in those populations because their diets are different. Their breastfeeding position is different. They're latching on. I mean, think about this from a, from a breastfeeding position. And this is horrible. I work with my daughter in my sleep practice and I have to say this story occasionally to patients, but I laid her horizontally like this and stuck a bottle vertically basically into her mouth and said, there you go, there's your dinner. I don't know how many of you already had supper tonight, but if you did, how many of you laid down to eat it? Probably none of you. I know I had a couple slices of pizza just before we went on and had a uh, uh, diet soda. And when I did that, I drank it all sitting up. And, and if we lay down, there's all this irritation and gurgling that happens back there. And it's no wonder we have to be burped when we're done eating. That's much less likely with a vertical kind of feeding position. Well, those aren't the only things that drive obstructive sleep apnea. This is a very interesting graph where we look at a population back in 1994. That was the first year that every single state, prior to that many states did, that was the first year that every single state reported their obesity levels within their population. And what's interesting to look well, it's interesting to note when you look at those two colors of blue on the graph is no state had above 20% obesity in their population. Fast forward to 1999, fast forward to 2004, 2009, 2024, I'm sorry, 2014. And then finally, of course, most recently, the 2019 data where no state essentially has below 20% um, obesity within the population. So in a very brief period of time, from 1994 in 26 years, we've gone from a nation with an obesity rate of below 20% to an obesity rate where no state is below 20%. When I get fatter, my earlobes get fatter, my nose gets fatter, my tongue is a very marbleized muscle, and marble, of course, is fat, great place to deposit that stuff. I'll have a fatter tongue, and if I gain weight, my airway might become thicker too. My tongue becomes easier to fall back and close off my airway. I also run into problems with the weight on my thoracic cavity and my ability to move fluids around while I'm sleeping. And there's all kinds of conditions with regard fluid shift when we're sleeping and poor respiration. So we are set up as a society physiologically to experience more sleep apnea. There's no question at all about that. Well, that's a quick overview, uh, as quick as I could possibly go through it. Now let's talk a little bit about screening, um, if needed, and consults, and testing, all of that. So I, I love this story, and I wish I had more time to play with it a little bit, but I want you to think about how many, what percentage of your patients do you do an oral cancer exam on, a perio charting, an occlusal analysis. You look for third molars and determine whether or not they're present or should be extracted. You evaluate teeth in terms of whether or not they're candidates for endodontic therapy or, or removal in an implant placement. Oral cancer examination is done every single time on every single hygiene visit, almost without exception in this country. And yet the incidence, if we were in a room full of 100 people and we've got that kind of number here tonight, and I said, everybody raise your hands if you've ever found oral cancer on a patient, a smattering of hands would go up. Uh, raise your hand if you found oral cancer twice, most of the hands would go down. Three times, almost all the hands would go down. Four times, I'd be alone in the room if, my hand was up. But 20 to 25 percent of your patients have obstructive sleep apnea, and the average dentist is not screening for it at all. And uh, the good news is the American Dental Association would tell us that we have a responsibility to do an oral cancer exam and a period charting and a occlusal evaluation and all that. Well, in 2017, they wrote a white paper, a resolution that said we should be screening for sleep-related breathing disorders. We don't have to treat them. I don't have to treat oral cancer or perio or third molars or do root canals. I did do a lot of occlusal evaluation and, and, and treatment when I was practicing dentistry. I don't do it anymore, just sleep. But we don't have to treat those things, but I have to screen for them. It's my responsibility as their primary care dentist to screen for this broad spectrum of diseases and then refer to the appropriate specialists or treat the perio or treat the, treat the thirds, do the endo, do the ortho, whatever it might be, if it's something I'm interested in and I think I'm good at. 
So that's the point I want to make is the average dentist is not screening their patient population appropriately. Ah, it goes one step further. If a patient had a lesion like this on the ventral surface of the tongue, what would you tell them? Tell them they should get it checked. Would you say, eh, you got a little thing there, you should get it checked. No, you try to scare the hell out of them because you know what that could mean. And yet some dentists who do a little bit of screening of patients don't put the emphasis on it in terms of what the health risk is in terms of obstructive sleep apnea for them. So I guess my challenge here is for us to position thinking about treating obstructive sleep apnea, at least screening obstructive sleep apnea in our practices at a level in such a way like we would other differently important diseases that we see and treat. Probably the easiest way to screen, not very effective, but the easiest way to screen is an Epworth sleepiness or drowsiness scale. Uh, nine questions score from zero to three. So you can score from zero to 27. Any number nine or higher means you have excessive sleepiness. Now my patient we treated with drug resistant hypertension was still pretty tired during the day because he had triplets. So there's lots of reasons to be tired. The bad news about this, this screening questionnaire is it has very poor correlation as to whether or not the patient actually has obstructive sleep apnea. The good news about this screening scale is it's a very easy conversation starter to start to talk to a patient about obstructive sleep apnea. This should be a part and parcel of everybody's health history examination and should be reviewed periodically with patients. The other good news about this is if you do decide to treat obstructive sleep apnea, I can assure you that almost every insurance company will ask you what was the Epworth sleepiness scale score. Did they have, did the patient have excessive daytime sleepiness or not? And that becomes an important consideration for an insurance company in terms of in, in, um, reimbursement. And that's weird and it's archaic, but we all know how weird some insurance companies and reimbursement models are. The far better screening tool would be to ask eight questions to stop bang. Now, there are other screening tools as well. We have an hour. So we're gonna talk about the one that I think is the best, most accurate and between 86 and 96%. So let's pick the difference in between and say 91 or 92. 91% 91 predictive for whether or not the patient will have obstructive sleep apnea. You're at moderate risk if three of these questions are positive. You're at high risk if four, five, six, seven, or eight are positive. So let's do this on me. Do I snore? Yes, if I'm not wearing moral appliance. Am I tired during the day? Those of you who know me is I'm the Energizer Bunny. I'm never tired during the day. Observe, stop breathing. Nope, Denise has never seen me gasp for air when I'm sleeping. I don't have high blood pressure. I'm feeling pretty good. I only got one. Ooh, BMI of 30. Well, I'm 28, 29. I'm right around there. So I'm pretty close. Age 50. Yep, I'm north of 50 by 14 years. I have a 17 and a half inch neck. I wear an 18 shirt and I am male. So I have four, maybe four and a half. And four, five, six, seven, or eight put me at high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. And if I do a sleep test, you'd find out that 20 times per hour, once every three minutes, my blood oxygen drops three or 4%. And I have an arousal. I wake up. And that interrupts my sleep. I did not know that until 2012. And in 2012, when I was told I probably had sleep apnea and denied it, got tested and found out I did, I started wearing our appliance and I went, oh, that's what a good night's sleep feels like. Because I'm kind of hyperactive, ADD-ish. Yeah, everybody who knows me, some of you are laughing right now. Uh, you could have done that diagnosis from a mile away. Of course you could. So I'm full of energy during the day. But I'll tell you what, I didn't know what a good night's sleep was till I slept with my jaw in a forward position and opened my airway in the back and didn't get disrupted. In fact, I had noticed uh, eight years ago that I was getting up more and more at night to go pee. And, uh, and I would have thought I was getting up more and more at night to go pee because maybe my bladder, maybe my prostate. Oh, no. It's because I was getting to this level of arousal. And one of the things that you'll pick up is you go, hey, I think I got to pee. And you have trouble going back to sleep. And so it really impacts the quality of night. So now, typically for me, I'll go to bed at, oh, I don't even want to tell you. I'll go to bed at 8 o'clock most nights. But I get up early as, as many of you know me if, if can test to. But test too. So um I go to bed at eight o'clock. So I might get up around 2.30, 3, 3.30 in the morning, go pee. And then I have to decide if I'm going back to bed or not. And I usually try to go back to bed and sleep till 3.30 or four. I try to get eight hours in the bed, which will give me seven to seven and a half hours of actual sleep. And then my phone will tell me because I run these metrics on it every night as to how good my sleep was. And it'll tell me with my Fitbit, um, 
exactly how many hours sleep I got, how many times I got up to go pee, uh, how much time I spent in REM, how much time I spent in deep sleep, given my heart rate, all that. And believe it or not, this cool um, data that they have for this kind of stuff will also show me my oxygen level on the bottom. And the, the top line shows variation. So that's a pretty flat line on the bottom. That means my pulse oximeter on my Fitbit watch was telling me I slept pretty darn good last night. And I went to bed, I don't even wanna tell you, 7.42, so I'm sorry, it's, it's not fun. I'm not a fun guy to go to a party with, that's for sure. Other things we can look at when we're looking at a patient and figuring out if they have obstructive sleep apnea now is we can look for where we know about sleep bruxism and how just before the arousal, there's this bruxism event that seems to occur. And so there's this tie-in between bruxism and sleep apnea that we know about now. Mandibular tori, tongue size, scalloping, palate, uvula, septum, uh, just basic space management, obesity, and certain adaptions. Um, you'll see uh, these are pristine kind of impressions of teeth. They must be missing a lateral incisor or something, have a flipper, but, but those are incredible indentations on scalloping. You don't see that very often. In kids, we'll look at bedtime issues, excessive sleepiness during the day, awakenings at night, and any kind of uh, duration of sleep issues or any snoring sounds that a kid makes. Any one of these factors means a kid probably has obstructive sleep apnea, probably has a bony box, tongue size discrepancy, large tonsils. This is my granddaughter. Uh, those are my stainless steel crowns. I didn't do them, but I gave them to her because I probably fed her way too much candy as a granddaughter. And so she ended up with decay on four teeth. Uh, the bottom ones needed stainless steel crowns. So I was a bad grandpa. But look how beautiful her teeth are. And so nice and tight together. And this is when she was five years old, five and a half. And so we sent her to a pediatric uh, uh, sleep apnea dentist who treats uh, very young children with growth appliances. Now she's got these marvelous spaces between her teeth, all kinds of growth. She doesn't snore anymore. And, uh, and she's losing all kinds of teeth and permanent ones coming in and there's gonna be space for everything. She's done rapid palate expansion, mandibular growth and development. It's been fantastic. She still has her tonsils and they've been getting smaller. Hmm, I wonder why that is. Because they're not being irritated by that air coming in through her mouth. One of the treatments we looked at doing for, for Molly was maybe taping her and teaching her better nasal breathing, but she seems to have learned that on her own. But sometimes I'll actually tape kids um, like that. My grandson, on the other hand, a different child and different grandson side, so to speak. That's my daughter's daughter, and the other one's my son's son. Uh, started wetting his bed again after he got a little bit older. Guess what? Tonsils and anoids out, some growth and development, and sure enough, oh, that ceased. So we see those kinds of patterns of development. So screening our patients, recognizing the early signs and propensity for the development of obstructive sleep apnea in kids or seeing the signs in adults is critical for us, and, and it certainly is our responsibility. So moving from screening to testing. Now, remember, you could stop here. You could say, Mark, I'm done. I'll, I'm going to sit around for the end code at the end of this thing. But basically, I know a little bit about sleep now. I'm going to screen my patients better. Thank you so much for encouraging me. And I'm going to send them to somebody else. And you find somebody around you. Well, if you decide to treat those patients, I'm going to tell you, making oral appliances for obstructive sleep apnea is, I don't know, maybe 10% of the work, maybe 20% of the work, but not 30 of making a bite splint. The, the fit, the delivery, the adjustment, far easier. Um, certainly incredibly rewarding. Uh, today, we have to worry about making people bite splints because yesterday when I was doing regular dentistry and, and, and treating a lot of TMD patients, I made a lot of central glacial splints. We know today, ACP paper reminds us that uh, if we're gonna make a splint for somebody, for clenching or grinding, we better assess their airway first because if we make them a centric relation or an MIP appliance and all mine were centric relation, um, we're actually closing their airway because we open their vertical and we rotate around that position of the mandible, we're actually minimizing the airway space. So really for some patients who have sleep-related bruxism or any kind of bruxism, we might be making their airway worse by making them a bite split. So that's very challenging for us to hear um, I, I try to justify it in my mind that at the time I did the best I could with the knowledge base I had. There's my knowledge, and, it, and it's funny because I made my first sleep device teaching with Keith Thornton down at the Pankey Institute back about 30 years ago, but we didn't know that much about sleep back then. We were pulling people's jaws forward, but we weren't testing them. We weren't titrating them. We weren't, they weren't adjustable devices. It was a mess. But now we know that um, we don't just jump in there and make a bite for somebody that clenches or grinds. We have to think about airway. We have to put airway first. And so we might have to make some sort of a mandibular repositioning device 
and put them in a different position. But if I'm going to go treat these people, I have to know how to test. And so testing, what you'd see is the, the old style method that you'll still see quite often. And I do this about, oh, I don't know, 40% of my patients. I, I, they're sent to me. I don't screen any patients because I don't have any patients. I don't have a practice for dentistry. But I've got about six or seven um, local dentists and a couple of three sleep physicians that refer me patients. And so um, a, a referring dentist will send me a patient. They've screened them. I'll rescreen them, in essence, sit down and talk to them. And if they have a complex medical history, if they're in Medicare, uh, if, if I suspect it's going to be severe apnea and they should be on a CPAP instead of an oral appliance anyhow, I'll probably send them right to the sleep physician locally. We'll do either an in-lab polysomnogram, not so often, probably about 20, 25% of the time today, or a home sleep test, a home sleep apnea test, whatever you want to call it. The problem with sending them any patient to a physician is physicians still believe, most physicians still believe, I got a couple of very enlightened ones, but a lot of physicians still believe CPAP is the gold standard. And, and it is if the patient will wear it, but not that many people will wear it. And that's a big problem. 40% uh, of the patients who get a sleep apnea uh, treatment with a, a CPAP wear it and they wear it about half the time. So it's not a very effective treatment, even though the efficacy, think about that, the efficacy is quite high, but the effectiveness is quite low because the compliance or the adherence is poor. Or the appliances work the other way. They don't work 100% of the time, but they work great for mild, good for moderate, and eh, 50-50 for severe, but the compliance is high. We'll get patients to wear them 90, 95% of the time, all of the night, seven nights a week. So if I send a patient locally, they often end up with a CPAP. And then if they fail CPAP, I hope that physician's enlightened enough to send them back to me. I actually work with a couple of physicians who send me almost all the mild and moderates that don't have unusual medical histories. And they know that I'm going to send them all the severes that I'm up into. So we get along just fine. The pathway that we see more likely today, more often today, and, and I see this with about 60% of my patients, is I'll see the patient, screen them coming in from the other office. And I, unless they're fit one of the 40% categories that I just talked about, I will order their sleep test. And in most states, I'll show you in a second which ones, in most states we can do that. I can't read the test and interpret the results, but I can order the test up. And then I have a physician do a telemedicine visit with the patient and they read the test and I'm working there with a, a telemedicine company that's oral appliance friendly and kind of for most of the mild and moderates, I'll get the case back with a prescription for oral appliance. And for the severes, most of the patients will be offered a CPAP first. And the ones that decline that, refuse it, or fail it, end up coming back from oral appliance anyhow. So then they get the either home sleep test or polysomnogram, but now it's almost always a home sleep test in those experiences. And they come back to me with a prescription for oral appliance and we're off to the races and building medical insurance and making those devices. So on the former pathway, I probably get of the 40% that I send to my local physicians, I get probably a quarter or a third of those back as uh, oral appliance treatments. And then on these patients that I send for um, home sleep testing where I order up the test with a telemedicine company, um, we probably get 80% of those back for oral appliance therapy prescriptions. Now in most states, not all states, but in most states, not New York, not Ohio, not Virginia, it's questionable North Carolina, not Georgia, not Alabama, we can order sleep tests as dentists. According to the ADA, we can always use a sleep test as a titration tool to see if we're in the right position after we have a prescription. But uh, in those select states, you can't order the diagnostic test, even though you're not gonna read it, you can't order it up. It has to be ordered by a physician. Also for a Medicare patient, the Medicare, uh, I can't order a sleep test for a Medicare patient, that has to be ordered by a sleep physician. So I send all of my over 65 patients to my local sleep docs, I could send them for a telemedicine consult and they'd start the ball rolling down there too. But a lot of those patients are, are going to be severe. Um, they're going to have more challenging medical history. So they're more likely to fall into that 40% category for me anyhow. When we do the test, there's lots of different types of tests. There's an attended polysomnogram full channel test. Um, that's where you go to a sleep clinic. Somebody watches you, tons of leads, lots of information, high five, great data. It's the gold standard in sleep tests with the possible exception that sleeping in a foreign location with a bunch of wires hanging off you doesn't feel very natural. Then there's an unattended, still the same number of wires and channels and lots of information, in, in, but you get to do it at home, so it's unattended. That would be a, a type two home sleep test. 
A type three home sleep test is similar, but won't tell you the stages of sleep, even though my phone can give you an approximation and some very simple sleep devices like this little night owl that just wraps around your finger can also give you some of that same information. So it's interesting. And, and also one more um, type would be the WatchPat One. The WatchPat One is a wrist pulse oximeter. There's no picture on the box and I don't want to open it up. So, you know, it's a wrist with a finger uh, cot on it at the end for a pulse oximeter, but it's really a full home sleep test, but it will not do sleep staging at the level that a polysomnogram or a type two test would. And then there's unattended, lim unattended limited channels, which would be a true pulse oximeter, which isn't giving you anything like a sleep test. It's just telling you heart rate and maybe heart rate variability and uh, pulse oximetry at three or 4%. Uh, the polysomnogram, sleep clinic, four in bed, all kinds of wires, type one test, type two and type three tests look very similar. The difference is if you look closely in the type three test, this is the one I use, uh, a general sleep Z machine, if I, if I do send that out. And one of my sleep testing companies uses RedMed's Apnea Link Air, but they look very identical. But the general sleep machine also has a lead, if you notice coming off the top, that runs around to the back of the head and has a couple of mastoid process uh, electroencephalograms and one that fits on the nape of the neck and is able to give us some hypnograms. Hypnogram is telling us what stage of sleep the patient's in. And the uh, simpler type three sleep tests don't have it. You don't need a type two test very often. I have it because I have some airline pilots who are patients and airline pilots uh, are required to have a slight type one or type two test. Uh, the FAA will not accept the type three test at this time. And so because I have some of them, I have this sleep test. It's about, about $2,000. And so if, if, I couldn't, if I couldn't do that, I'd send them for polysomnogram to another clinic. Uh, these are the pulse oximeters that I use. Uh, I have about eight of these. This is a CMI Health, C as in cat, M as in Mark, I as in India, CMI Health. They're about 200 bucks, maybe 220 bucks. I don't even know. Wrist pulse similar, they record just about two nights worth of data on a couple of AAA batteries, and then I can upload that. I had a patient drop one off uh, while I was seeing some patients this afternoon. I read it tonight, and they had gone from a, a mild obstructive sleep apnea to 1.9 episodes per hour. Feeling pretty good about that. Now, that's only pulse oximetry, though. So it's just telling me, do I think, does the patient think we're in the right spot? Patient said, at this one millimeter of advancement from where we started, where I took the bite, they're sleeping better, they're not snoring, and they're not tired during the day. So I said, great, wear this pulse oximeter, let's get one more piece of objective data to go with your subjective observations. And if all that information is good, which it was, boom, let's shoot you out there for a follow-up sleep test. And that's where we're at with him. I would also add that there's type four observations we can make. This is a snore lab, one word, snore lab, L-A-B. And this is actually, this is an airline pilot, one of the airline pilots I was talking about. And this is uh, April 18th and this is April 24th, uh, roughly a week later, six days later. Um, actually, I should have put in his April 19th, which looks just about like this one, but he had uh, maybe four minutes of that. Epic snoring is uh, loud snoring is just heavy breathing and light and quiet snoring are exactly as they described. Uh, forget the sleep score. That's kind of a snore lab kind of thing they do to give you a grade. Look at the minutes of Epic. He went from an hour and a half of Epic and an hour and 44 of loud breathing snoring to one minute of Epic and 37 minutes of loud snoring. Also, I can tell you his sleep apnea score went down from about 28, I think he was, to about a six or a seven here. So a tremendous change in how he feels, how he's snoring, and, and how well he's able to uh, feel rested during the day, and how well he's able to keep his pilot's license and fly. So it's pretty fun stuff. All right, so now we've got the patient tested. And now let's talk about treating. And treatment is going to be, we're going to do an exam, impressions, bite registration, and then we're going to titrate the patient, then we're going to retest them, and then we'll have follow-up visits. So pretty straightforward. <clears throat> we will do a dental exam. None of the patients I see are my patients. Most of them have another dentist, the vast majority. I still do an exam. I still do a tooth exam, gum exam, a TMJ exam, muscle palpation, all the kinds of things you think I do to make sure uh, asphaltate sounds, everything like that, so that I can document the patient's condition before treatment and then follow that after treatment. Because if there's any change, 
I want to be able to notice those differences and deal with it. The good news is if there are some side effects or some issues that come up, airway sort of trumps everything. So airway for those patients are generally much more important than a slight bite change or a little um, mouth dryness or excessive salivation or anything like that. So from an exam, impressions, bite registration standpoint, that's how we get going. I also tell the patient that there's lots of different treatment options. Sometimes it's just positional. There are some people, not very many, that if they sleep on their side or on their face, the apnea goes away. It's rare, but it does happen. Certainly for most people, it gets better if we sleep on our sides than if we sleep on our backs. It's just, it's just gravity. Oral appliance therapy, then I talk about the various PAP therapies. There's autonomic PAP, there's BiPAP, biphasic, and there's continuous uh, positive airway pressure. And then adjunctive uh, treatments like oxygen, not so often, meds, not so often, bariatric surgery. And then there's uh, UPPP, U-palatoplasty uh, uh, procedures, which only work about 10 to 12% of the time in adults, much more uh, uh, good procedure to have tonsils and aneurysms removed in kids. But what is a very effective treatment is MMA, maxillary mandibular advancement, is about 95% effective across everybody. And the compliance is quite good. Break the jaws, move forward, wire them shut, they'll stay there. Inspire is a, a glossal nerve stimulation. Uh, what they forget to tell you in those cute little ads is they implant a pacemaker-like thing on your chest, leaves you a bump, and they snake some wires up into your um, hypoglossal nerve, up in your hypoglossal muscle, so they can stimulate it when you go to bed and keep a certain amount of tonicity in it so that you don't um, have an apneic episode while you're sleeping. Holy cow. It's a little bit more invasive surgery, and it's about 50 or 60 thousand dollars. So as treatments go, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty invasive, but it is a Cadillac kind of treatment, that's for sure. When we look at uh, oral appliance and CPAP therapy, we talked about this a little bit already, that compliance is a big issue. And so what happens is if we take that efficacy times the compliance, we get a mathematical calculation of what we might call effectiveness. And so actually oral appliance therapy has been shown to be more effective, even though physicians don't believe in it yet, they're not writing prescriptions for it in mass, it only represents about 5% of the treatment, 5% of the treatment, 90% of the treatment goes for uh, CPAP, 5% goes for those various other surgical procedures we talked about, and only 5% goes to oral appliance therapy. And yet in some European countries, it's 50 and 60% are oral appliance therapy and they treat it that way first. Well, medicine is coming around, though. They're slowly coming around. And this was one of the studies that helped them come around to it a little bit. This is from 2016. This is the McAvoy. It's the SAVE trial. It's a very, very interesting, very, very challenging trial uh, for them, for physicians, I think. They took 2,687 patients. They, gave, they were all moderate and severe sleep apneics. They gave half of them a CPAP and half of them no treatment. And they followed them for, look at that, they followed them for seven years. And look at those two lines. Treated and untreated, no difference. The bad news is in a large population, if you treat them with CPAP and only 40% wear it, and they wear it on average half the time, and they usually wear it the first half of the night, which is better than the second half of the night, because the second half of the night, they need it more. So it'd be better if they wore it the second half of the night. There's no effective change in the cardiovascular events for those populations. That's scary as hell. Now, truly in those studies were some patients that wore their CPAP every night, and they got much better. But as a statistical analysis of a group, there was no difference between being treated and untreated. Device selection, um, there's been quite an evolution in the different kinds of devices. Uh, we made these very crude looking things that look like impression trays on the upper and a flat tray on the bottom and this, this upper handle hit on this flat part. And once the mandible went forward, this thing could fall down, horrible looking devices. Then they've evolved into different adjustable devices with different types of materials. We've got all kinds of different polymethyl methacrylates. We've got some printed nylons. Today, the cat's pajamas are probably demilled PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. That's correct, the old plasticky stuff. But instead of you know um, salt and pepper and then putting it in a pressure pot, this stuff is made industrially. And then it's milled, it's milled. Let me get a piece to show you this. I'm sure I have it handy on my desktop. They mill it nowadays. Uh, some of the better manufacturers will mill it out of a puck like this. So what happens is because it's milled out of this harder acrylic, it's so much stronger, they can make it smaller, they can make it lingualless, give you more tongue space, um, and it's much more comfortable to wear. So the evolution, if you will, of the different designs and materials, and now the, the CAD CAM advantages, the robotic manufacturing, the artificial intelligence that goes into the design of these is phenomenal. So I would argue that the, probably the easiest way of looking at the evolution for these materials is from a temporary kind of material where you could see a MyTap or a 
Blue Pro or an Apnea uh, Guard to custom uh, varieties of materials made out of a variety of different products, but they still lack the precision that we see now in the latest evolution of products and materials that we're working with today. Uh, the three devices I use most are the IA and IA Select, which is the number one device that's prescribed in North America today from Corsomnus, and then the CA, which is kind of a jack screw dorsal device. These both have 90 degree posts, which give them some advantages. And then for my Medicare patients, I use the Herbst device like this, which has this horrible Herbst arm and some little plastic nubs to kind of protect the screws so the patients don't get irritated. But these are a real pain in the butt because nobody likes these. Uh, this is the this is the probably the best variant that we can see out there is the IA Select. It's got anatomical form. It's very comfortable. Um, but you know, PDAC and Medicare has these unusual rules, so you have to have a metal attachment. So you have to use either tap device, which has a hook in the front, or Herbst device with something like this on the side. But um, I really don't use this middle one very much. I use probably 75 or 80 percent IAI Select, and then maybe 20 percent for my Medicare patients. I'll use the the Herbst design. Um, the designs we see with the new mill materials are smaller. All the studies have shown that. It's really pretty cool. And they can still wrap the distal so we don't get the kind of tooth movement that we used to see. They have a very, very accurate way in CAD CAM and robotic manufacturing and artificial intelligence to replicate the bite position. All of us here spend a lot of time really trying to tune in a bite when we do something. And unfortunately, most of the other material manufacturers, when they make a device for you, can be off one, two, or three, four millimeters from its original starting position in three-dimensional space. Prasamus was the only one that was able to uh, land those devices within one millimeter. Uh, Panthera's DSAD was just over a millimeter, but was pretty good. That kind of precision means fewer appointments, fewer adjustments, you can get the picture. Um, chair time is money no matter how you look at it, whether you're doing a crown prep or you're doing a veneer or cleaning, you've got to always gauge the business aspect of any of these kinds of procedures that we do. Uh, University of Pacific, a uh, good school out there out west, uh, Gene Santucci and, and his crew, the graduate students, did a really cool study where they followed these patients for two years, took new impressions digitally and overlaid them with their previous impressions that they had done, and there was no tooth movement. Every other type of device, hard acrylic, hard acrylic with soft liner, printed nylon, there were varying degrees of tooth movement in all those devices, but the precision engineering in these milled PMMA, and, and we'll see some new materials out soon, products uh, really fit like retainers and we don't get any tooth movement. There's also the ability to correct arch discrepancy, the right side of the arch and the left side of the arch could be off four, five, six, seven, eight degrees. And so if you just strap on the advancement mechanism on the both sides, I could push that person's jaw forward, kind of caddy wampus a little bit and off to one side. So in the software, the artificial engineering, I'm sorry, the artificial intelligence allows you to make those two arch forms identical so that patient advances along a straight line, which is kind of neat. These newer materials just don't stain up. You can see how they look on an electron micrograph. They look much smoother because they are, because they're much denser, even though they're similar acrylic materials, the printed nylon is the most porous. But you can see how in the middle there, they simply didn't take up the stain like some of the other variants did. Um, that's mustard staining uh, over a period of time. This is a new material that Prasomnus is coming out with. It'll be available next year. It's called Evo. It's got a little bit of flexibility to it. Other than that, it looks, looks and acts a lot like PMMA, but it's a little bit more flexible. But when it's flexible, you always worry that it's going to be uh, more stainable. And it turns out uh, using a colorimeter, they've measured the stainability of the original milled PMMA then this milled new MG6 material. And now we're looking at CPAP masks milled with liner, thermoplastic with liner. Look at how this pink device turns orange or this blue device turns green because it picks up the stain. Or this tap device just goes crazy yellow. And then the printed nylons are the most porous of all. But look at this. These are 30, 90, 19. That's how many delta E's in color differential the color owner was able to pick up. The more precision devices, the lingualist designs allow us to reach levels of efficacy that aren't as good as CPAP. No, they're not, but they're getting closer. Uh, my last, uh, let's see, 15, 67, my last 117 uh, devices that I did, we keep a lot of statistics on it. And I've got two papers that are being published this spring in the Journal of uh, Dental Sleep Medicine. I demonstrate about a 76% efficacy for me overall in mild, moderate, and severe populations. Um, now, I probably get better results because I kick some of the patients, so I don't think we're going to treat very well with our appliances to CPAP already. But um, most of the other studies would show somebody as a CPAP intolerant coming back. So that's some pretty good efficacy data. Lots of different ways to take the bite. And uh, the most prominent is going to be this device here in the middle, this uh, George Gage. 
but this is an airway metric spike, which allows you to introduce a lot more vertical. This is a TENS bite that they would do at the uh, uh, Las Vegas Institute. This is a dynamic bite. There's a little motor that attaches to this. And while the patient sleeps, you can advance their mandible and find the right position. It's pretty cool. We just can't figure out how to get paid for it yet. And then this is a pharyngometer, which pounds some um, sound waves down the tube. And then you try different positions and figure out um, where it might be best to put the mandible. Uh, the other alternative is an arbitrary position where we just simply say to a patient um, that maybe they should uh, go end to end. The problem with arbitrary positions in end to end, excuse me, I think this contract's out, my name got tangled and it's driving me crazy right now, is the problem if we go end to end or some sort of arbitrary position is um, uh, end to end for me, that's maximum protrusion. You could not get me to sleep eight hours with my man in that position. I would go crazy. So arbitrary positions really aren't a good way for us to take the bite. Um, the George gauge is neat though. It allows us uh, with a certain thickness of a bite fork, three millimeters, so that we have enough room for the appliance to measure the anterior, and, or, or say the protrusive and retrusive range of motion. We start most patients around 50%. We adjust a little bit for snoring test. We want a patient to pinch their nose, make a snoring sound. Then pinch their nose, advance their mandible, and make a snoring sound, and you can't make as good a snoring sound. So we want to find that spot, and it's around 50, 60%, but also comfortable for the muscles and ligaments being in that protruded position. So some combination of 50%, plus or minus a millimeter or two, depending on snore test and comfort for the patient, boom, that's where we start everybody. Um, I scan my patients digitally, but these are Kattenbach materials, putty wash, really nothing else would do, putty wash. These new mill devices, require a high degree of accuracy on the inputs. So a putty with a saran wrap over the top, just like you would do it for Invisalign, nothing different than that. Wash it with a light body material and you're home free with a very, very accurate impression. And, and these are two good examples of that of when I was taking analog impressions. We've been scanning now, I scanned three patients this afternoon. So that was kind of fun. Um, here's one of my case studies. This is the, the prior one, uh, maybe two prior actually now that I think about this. It's a 23 case series. And then I had a 27 after that and a 25 um, or 50 after that. Anyhow, uh, it just talks about, it. this is a, um, a documentation of my case success that I can use for talking with local physicians or showing my referring dentist. So they have an idea of how successful, how well we've been doing. Uh, the data is just uh, represented in a spreadsheet where we assign patients numbers, age, gender, baseline, diagnosis, HI with oral appliance therapy, uh, which device we used, and then the percent reduction that we had. And then we look at each of these populations. And I could open the spreadsheet and show you the moderates and severes too, but it's, it's all pretty, pretty impressive data overall. Uh, the billing is pretty easy. Um, I would never, um, let me back up. The billing is very easy for someone else to do. The billing is nearly impossible for a dentist to get able to do. So when we see people get interested in sleep medicine, dental sleep medicine, and they struggle and they don't go on with it, and we ask them, why didn't you go on? 19 times out of 20, it's because they couldn't get paid. And so then maybe they, they move to a cash model, which is okay. But, but actually, it's really easy to work with medical insurance. You just have to pay somebody to do all the medical insurance billing. And so there's a number of good companies out there. Um, uh, my daughter actually works for one, so we use that company. It's Four Pillars. It's part of DS3. Uh, DS3 is, is owned by a guy named Guy Atros, and he teaches part of the sleep course down at the Panky Institute. He's got a super good company. I use his software for keeping all my soap notes and communicating with physicians, keeping all my documentation in, and then I use his billing company for paying for stuff, so it works out really super well for us. You have to make decisions about what you, whether you want to be in or out of network. I always found it funny that in dentistry, I was non-par with all dental insurance. And the guy that bought my practice for me graduated in 1996, and he's never participated with any dental insurance company ever. And I participate with every medical insurance I can. It makes all of the systems easier for referrals from physicians, patients getting paid. And quite honestly, there's nothing more productive per hour that I know of a dentist can do than dental sleep medicine. It's uh, between two and two and a half times as productive per hour as crown and bridge procedures normally are in the average practice according to the ABA data. So it's, it's really quite good. Um, if you're gonna get into dental sleep medicine, you'll want to join the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine and probably take enough courses and take the test with them and become a qualified dentist. There's about 1,200 of those nationwide today. There's about five or 6,000 dentists doing some degree of sleep, 1,200 of which are qualified and 600 of which have done what I've done. And that's become board certified by the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine and become a diplomate 
at, at that board level. The American uh, Sleep and Breathing Association also has a, uh, they're small, they've got about 400 members. The ADSM has about three or 4,000. Then there's the American Academy of Cardio, and I'm, I'm members of all the highlighted ones. There's the American Academy of Cardiovascular Sleep Medicine. I'm a member of that. That's a physician's organization. The American Academy of Physio Physiological Medicine and Dentistry, and that's a lot of like a myofunctional therapy, orthodontist. It's a broad spectrum for treating apneas. And then there's the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. That's the sleep physicians group, and I'm also a member of that. Um, and, and I can't become board certified in that because I'm not a physician, but I can certainly participate in pretty much everything else they do. Oral facial, craniofacial pain, clinical sleep disorders, disciplines, all good organizations with all good education. Um, but even the Panky Institute course, believe it or not, great course, fantastic course. With Steve Carstensen, Guy Atros, John Remmers is there. I taught a little part of it. Mary Osborne came down and some case stuff. Fantastic. It's just really good course, really good course. Barry Raphael was down to do some of the ortho. Um, Christine LaJoy from Great Lakes was there. It's a great course. Doesn't count towards your certification um, and qualification with the ADSM. So you sort of have to run a parallel track with that, even though the Panky course itself is fantastic. So for qualified dentistry, you got to go through the ADSM um, or the AASM. And then Tufts, North Carolina, and the University of Pacific have qualified programs. We're going to try and make our program at the University of Detroit Mercy in that same vein as a qualified program. That's one of our fond desires and hopes. Um, I wanted to say one more thing uh, that I forgot to say on a uh, previous slide before I finish up, and that's if you decide to go to sleep medicine and you decide to do what I do six or seven at a time, order the sleep test, I can never make a device for a patient unless I have two things in my hands, a copy of their sleep test that's recent, probably the last two or three years, sometimes last year, sometimes five years, every insurance company is different, and a prescription from a physician. I can't pretend to be treating their snoring. I can't treat snoring unless the patient is diagnosed as not having sleep apnea. If they don't have sleep apnea, then I can make them a oral appliance for snoring. But I need a diagnosis of not having sleep apnea. So we can never treat a patient for an airway disturbance without a prescription confirming or denying the presence of obstructive sleep apnea. I cannot make an oral appliance for a patient who doesn't want to wear their CPAP. I have to wait until I get a prescription from a physician. And some of them are hesitant to give those up. Some of them are very, very willing. 